So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Korzynski, and I'm a scientific program analyst with the National Cancer Institute. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for today's discussion on equipping the physical activity workforce for breakthroughs in public health research. Before we get started, I want to briefly go over a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording, slides, and transcripts will be distributed to everyone in the next few weeks. All attendees are in listen-only mode, so if you need technical or other assistance during the webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to the host. You may also call the WebEx support number listed here. You may submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box. Questions can be directed at one or multiple presenters and will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Please submit questions to all panelists, otherwise your question may be missed. And now to introduce our speakers. Dr. Heather Bowles will discuss the need for physical activity experts who can engineer solutions to dogged methodologic problems. Dr. Bowles is an epidemiologist in the Biometry Research Group in NCI's Division of Cancer Prevention, where she works with a group of mathematical statisticians on research methods and interpretation. Dr. Karen Pfeiffer and Dr. Kelly Petty Gabriel will then discuss how to equip physical activity scientists to be both basic and applied. Dr. Pfeiffer is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and faculty in the Center for Physical Activity and Health at Michigan State University. She has been studying physical activity and health-related fitness in children and youth for the past 22 years and has experience working with age groups ranging from preschool through college. Her main areas of expertise are in measurement of physical activity and interventions to increase physical activity. She has done the bulk of her work in the primary and secondary school setting but has recently engaged in more work in the preschool setting. Recently, she was an author of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans mid-course report and is a member of the team that created the Youth Compendium of Physical Activity. Dr. Gabriel is an associate professor at the University of Texas School of Public Health, Austin campus, and an adjunct associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, Dell Medical School. Dr. Gabriel has an MS in clinical exercise science received her PhD in epidemiology, and completed her postdoctoral training in physical activity and public health. She is also a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. Dr. Gabriel's research program consists of the development and evaluation of methodological strategies to optimize the precision of physical fitness, physical activity, and sedentary behavior measures. Her research also examines the timing of these exposure variables and risk of subsequent disease and disability using a life course perspective. She has ongoing collaborations with several U.S.-based cohort studies, including the CARDIA study, study of women's health across the nation, and atherosclerosis risk in community study. Dr. Matthew Buman and Dr. Genevieve Dunson will then discuss how to equip physical activity scientists to exploit technology and complex data. Dr. Buman is an associate professor at Arizona State University. His research focuses on the dynamic interplay of sleep, sedentary, and more active behaviors and how collectively these behaviors can be harnessed for health promotion and disease prevention. His work involves the assessment of behaviors across the 24 hours and innovative technology-supported interventions designed to singly or in combination improve behaviors across the 24 hours. Dr. Buman is currently the PI on three NIH grants from NCI, NIDDK, and NINR, has authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles, is a standing member of the Psychosocial Risk and Disease Prevention NIH study section, and currently serves as a special consultant to the 2018 HHS Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Council. Finally, Dr. Dunson is an associate professor at the University of Southern California. Her research examines the etiology of health behaviors related to chronic disease risk in adults and children with a focus on physical activity and nutrition. Dr. Dunson is also the director of the USC REACH Lab, whose goals are to develop, test, and apply real-time data capture methodologies including EMA and wearable sensors, to better understand the effects of time-varying factors on eating and physical activity episodes. She is the PI on six large studies funded by NIH and the American Cancer Society, author of over 100 peer-reviewed publications, and past chair of the APHA Physical Activity Section. She is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences panel on physical activity surveillance. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Bowles. Thanks, Robert. Um, 
thank you for the introductions. That was lovely. And thank you in a huge way for handling all the logistics of our webinar today. Uh, we really appreciate your help with this. So getting started, let's see here. There we go. So today's webinar is focused on physical activity, but we have quite a few listeners who are supporting research programs in other fields. And I'm glad that we piqued your interest in, in the talk today. And the truth is that the methodologic problems that we face in physical activity research are being felt across public health community um, and other, other disciplines and other subject areas. And commonly, there are two calls of action. One, we need to reframe our thinking, and two, we need to embrace technology. So how do we engage with one another to get over the hurdles that we have? Uh, well, our speakers today will provide us with some clues. And in my presentation, I'll walk you through some questions that we've been ask at, asking at NCI to gauge the extent of the issues. So as we've approached this, we've wondered, you know, what is it that we don't understand about physical activity assessment. What are the known unknowns? Um, you know, are we funding research to meet our needs methodologically? Is the community ready? So if we were to produce any sort of initiatives, funding initiatives or consortia or anything, is the community ready to be methodologically innovative? And then how can we work with the community to equip the, the workforce for new insights? So when we operationalize physical activity in public health research, we, we cite this definition of physical activity and general, generally resort to calculating energy expenditure. But researchers with training in kinesiology or exercise science study physical activity in terms that interface with physiology, biomechanics, motor control, cognition, and affect. And the hope among phys, uh, public health researchers then is that usual energy expenditure is a good enough translation, but it's really not. Because physical activity is operationalized in a highly abstracted way for a lot of applied research, we don't really glean much insight into how it works. So when we ask a question like, how does the level type or duration of physical activity influence cancer risk and prognosis, we're generally limited in the applied research in the ways that we can tease apart that question. That insight can be, can be found in the basic literature, but the translation and the synthesis hasn't really happened. And so it will be some time before we can really answer this question about physical activity. So are we helping ourselves get any closer to this? As a funding agency, you know, we have the ability to go in and look at what we're funding and, and what we're getting out of it. And so we looked at the portfolio of grants that were funded under activities that specifically targeted physical activity methods. We've had a number of PARs that have been out there on the street that have advertised and asked for grants on physical activity methods. Uh, about a quarter of them collected data on activity intensity, duration, and type. Um, so of those grants, eight of 35 collected something that would relate to the parameters that were specified in our NCI provocative question back in 2013. And an interesting observation from this was that all PIs on those grants, nearly all uh, PIs on those grants, had an exercise background or some understanding of the underlying basic science. But the bottom line as a funder is that we have been funding the creation of variables and not methods. And so what I mean by that is um, if we go into our history, we can see, you know, back in 1989, HHS published a manual on physical activity assessment and population science. And they made the conclusion that the field was nascent, uh, that it's barely beyond its infancy, both conceptually and operationally. And then in 1994, the highly regarded epidemiologist Jeremy Morris reiterated some of these concerns um, and, and also concluded that he's pessimistic that with the present methods, we can move much beyond the current situation. So there is this need to innovate. And yet, more than 20 years later, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we could be doing in physical activity assessment and methods, but we haven't resolved three major issues. One is a need for a consensus on exposure conceptual frameworks. Uh, we still don't understand what to do with variability and patterns of behavior with people. And we don't really have much consensus on how to tease apart the dosing parameters for physical activity because we, we rely on usual energy expenditure. That's not to say that we can't figure out those things because, like I said, the, the foundational understanding is there in the basic literature. It, it's going to take uh, work to translate it and synthesize it in a satisfactory way. So this investigation led me to question 
And since the foundational understanding of physiology, biomechanics, motor control, cognition, and effect is accessible, you know, to experts with background in this, are they able to methodologically innovate? And so we, we did a survey here of students, and we focused on physical activity research programs, um, and not, we didn't include computer science or data science disciplines, uh, because I live with a really lovely group of statisticians, and they have impressed upon me that statistics can't do your science for you. So if we start with people who should understand the science, how prepared are they to innovate um, with their tools and their methods? Well, this spring, NCI conducted a, a survey of students. And uh, we, we targeted PhD students in physical activity-focused programs, either traditional exercise science or a public health program with some sort of certificate or, or emphasis in physical activity. And then we asked them about their comfort level with big data or complex data tasks. And these are things that the scientific enterprise can't stop talking about. I mean, we're all hearing about technology and data. So, you know, we asked them about a, a, a few different, a set of, of data tasks. And in general, they reported greater comfort when it comes to things like using what's available. However, when we asked about tasks that are more sophisticated or require a bit more uh, manipulation on their part, the students reported a lot less comfort. Uh, so when we're dealing with writing computer programs or coming up with you know, applying more sophisticated statistical techniques or developing new instruments, you know, the majority of, of our new PhD scientists are reporting that they're not very comfortable with those tasks. My point here is not to pick on students. Uh, the reason why we did this survey was to try to understand where we are as a field. And so we have here a, a typical response from one of the students that capture things we heard from many of our respondents, and it's that they don't feel that the traditional methods are really going to be applicable to, to what's possible out there. And my point here is not to pick on faculty or those who are working with students either, because I think as a funding agency, we have to acknowledge and accept our role in this ecosystem. You know, we teach what we know, but we know what we research. And the truth is that a lot of these graduate students are funded off of our grants that we, um, that we provide to the community. And I think that most program officers and program directors have heard a similar sentiment from their investigators in the community that they know that they could do something different and they can do something more innovative and they could do something more interesting, but the system that we have in place doesn't really facilitate that. So let's all begin from a place of wanting more from our physical activity research. And it's clear that we need to cultivate methodologic innovation as a keystone discipline for physical activity scientists. Um, there's some discussion about whether we should try to codify universal instruments or universal approaches, but that just really doesn't feel like the right approach for right now. And I think that this is, we are in an environment that is um, a, a methodologic transition and innovation that is um, being experienced broadly by public health, not just by physical activity. So it seems that cultivating this methodologic innovation as a discipline uh, would entail two things. One, facilitating a conceptual pivot for the field, and the other, an operational pivot. And so we've invited today uh, Karen Pfeiffer and Kelly Petty-Gabriel to talk about how we translate and synthesize our basic understanding. And we've invited Matt Booman and Genevieve Dunton to talk about how we take design in a more exciting direction. So webinar listeners, there's, there's um, 71 of you on the line right now. Thank you for joining us today, and I now turn over the presentation to Karen Pfeiffer. Thank you, Heather, and big thanks to Robert for setting us up today, and thanks to all of you for being here. The way that Kelly and I have conceptualized the first piece of this talk is to tell you a little bit about how our doctoral students are being trained. And so we're calling that the formative years. Um, and then Genevieve and Matt will focus on more postdoctoral sorts of opportunities. And the way it typically has happened in the past for a physical activity researcher to develop is that we've had these traditional tracks at play. And essentially, we have 
one line where physical activity researchers tend to come up through kinesiology and a second track where researchers tend to come up through public health. And often what is happening is an occasional interplay between the two, but typically you're really seeing more of a siloed approach where people are just coming up through one track or the other and there's very little crosstalk between the two unless advisors or students themselves are, are able to set that up. Getting specific about the tracks, I'm going to start and talk about kinesiology, then Kelly's going to uh, come in and speak about the public health piece. In kinesiology, the coursework typically includes undergraduate or graduate level training in kinesiology or some sort of related discipline. And what that means is traditional kinesiology tends to incorporate several subdisciplines and is multidisciplinary in and of itself as a field. So often people will have training in areas like exercise physiology, but then they also receive training in biomechanics, motor learning, motor development, motor control. They will also get training in areas such as adapted physical activity and some of the psychosocial types of areas and cultural types of areas are typically included in a kin typical kinesiology curriculum. If you have something that's more of an exercise science, that tends to be a little bit more specific. And I think that typically you, you approach, you know, two to three of the subdisciplines in an exercise science program, but not all the full complement that a traditional kinesiology program would have. And now Kelly will tell you about the public health track. Thank you, Karen. There we go. Um, the public health or applied physical activity research track typically involves graduate level training at both the master's and doctoral levels. Pertinent to the doctoral degrees, uh, one could uh, work towards a doctor of philosophy or a doctor of public health degree. Also, currently, there are several academic institutions that are now offering undergraduate degree programs in public health as well, and those are typically conferred as a Bachelor of Science degree. Coursework within public health could be more broad, just like it was for kinesiology, or it could involve exposure to a specific area. So, for example, a specialization in epidemiology. Uh, one important note about uh, public health programs is that these are guided and accredited by the Council on Education for Public Health. Therefore, a, po a specific focus in physical activity is typically integrated into, de de into degree programs as a concentration or a breadth area. And these specialty courses are typically taken as electives rather than core um, degree program requirements. So this slide uh, outlines uh, typically what the infrastructure looks like for transdisciplinary training. Karen, Karen mentioned on the first slide that there are a few what I like to call trailblazers that have found opportunity, opportunities to include kinesiology and public health into academic training. However, the current infrastructure is quite unstable. Uh, for example, just to give you a little piece of how um, Karen and I both managed to do this. Her formal coursework uh, through her doctoral work was in kinesiology. However, she opted to complete a certificate program in epidemiology during her doctoral degree program. In terms of my own background, I completed my bachelor's and master's of science degrees in exercise science, then pursued epidemiology for my doctoral training. There are quite a few other examples of ways that others have integrated kinesiology and public health training. However, one common thread is that the desire for transdisciplinary training is entirely driven by the individual student. And this may or may not have resulted uh, through advice from his or her faculty mentor. Quite often, it simply happens by chance. So what are the current hurdles? First, there are several academic models that exist. For example, there is one model where kinesiology and public health coexist within the same academic institution and or school. 
So for example, the University of South Carolina in their School of Public Health, they both include, that School of Public Health includes public health uh, disciplines as well as exercise science. However, there's a second model, and this is um, currently what I'm facing here in Austin, Texas, and this is where the uh, academic programs are separate at separate institutions from each other. So for example, the kinesiology program is part of the University of Texas at Austin, whereas the School of Public Health is affiliated with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, with uh, Austin serving as one of the six public health campuses. This is somewhat similar to um, the University of Pittsburgh, where the kinesiology program is affiliated with the School of Education, and the public health programs are part of the school of Graduate School of Public Health. With the second model, and again, I'm talking about the Austin model or the Pittsburgh model, coordination between the programs is almost entirely reliant on faculty joint appointments and or adjunct positions, which adds another layer of complexity and bureaucracy. Second, there are a limited number of trailblazer mentors that have come from a truly transdisciplinary background. To keep up with the rapidly changing field, must, mentors must also commit to a lifetime lifetime learning model. However, academics are continually faced with institutional pressures to secure traditional funding lines that are focused on establishing and or continuing an independent trajectory of research. This leaves little time for continuing education given other expectations for teaching and service and can further lead to research silos that Karen mentioned on her first slide. Finally, truly transdisciplinary research involves partnerships with non-traditional disciplines for example, efforts focused on big data should include coordination with departments of data science or bioinformatics. Again, these specialties may or not be physically located at the same academic institution, and there may be a steep learning curve as terminology approaches and methodology are shared across partners. So what's currently available for transdisciplinary training? Uh, in a nutshell, the opportunities are quite limited. Within the academic infrastructure, a motivated student could actively seek out academic programs with good relations across disciplines, yet these quote-unquote good relations are often not conveyed in a systematic way and may or may not come up during the interview process um, with prompting from the student applicant. Also, once enrolled in an academic program, a motivated student could also actively seek out opportunities to get involved in transdisciplinary research However, this relies on a faculty member having an active grant or available graduate assistant position. Of course, if willing, the student could also serve as an unpaid volunteer. Um, an active student could also integrate transdisciplinary training into their core requirement by selecting appropriate elective courses and focusing their culminating experience program requirements on a physical activity related topic. Outside of the academic infrastructure, again, opportunities for the student are limited. He or she could attend scientific conferences and network with the experts, yet conferences might be a difficult venue for students to get any real face time with the experts. Students could also seek out funding opportunities for travel or research awards. However, the funds available are typically quite limited. To strengthen the infrastructure and enhance opportunities for transdisciplinary training during the formative years, support is needed at the student, faculty, mentor, and organizational levels. This multi-level approach is similar to the socio-ecological th theoretical framework for health and wellness. However, given, the hurdles, given that hurdles exist at all levels, strategic planning and creative solutions are needed as the first step. Over the next several slides, Karen and I will focus our discussion on ways that the NIH may help strengthen the infrastructure to foster and support opportunities for transdisciplinary training during the formative years. As mentioned previously, to truly produce, uh, provide transdisciplinary opportunities to the next generation of physical activity researchers, academic institutions, and individual faculty members need support. Given the sheer number of hurdles, the logical first step is to establish and convene a web of experts for strategic planning, including the identification of traditional NIH funding mechanisms that may serve as creative solutions. For example, one solution may be to create a targeted funding opportunity announcement using the P 
or U mechanism that is specifically designed to establish transdisciplinary physical activity centers. Also, the development of physical activity focused institutional training grants using the T32 mechanism could be used to prepare trainees at both the pre-doctoral and postdoctoral level. As one of the few modifiable risk factors, I think we can all agree that training the next generation of physical activity researchers to be more transdisciplinary has the potential to make a significant impact on the healthcare needs of U.S. children and adults. Finally, more focused funding opportunities under the T35 mechanism may provide opportunities for pre-doctoral and postdoctoral trainings to receive focused short-term training during the summers when course schedules and program requirements are a bit more flexible. And Karen will discuss some other options. Thank you, Kelly. Now, what we've created for the last few slides are some very specific ideas about existing mechanisms that could be modified in some way to facilitate training of transdisciplinary work. And this list is by no means exhaustive. There are certainly other mechanisms that could be used, but we thought these might be some good examples. First, I'll address the mentors. And then I'll address for students after that. And for the mentors themselves, we have mechanisms such as the K-5. And right now, that mechanism doesn't have any FOAs even available, um, the last I, I looked. But that is for a senior research scientist. And it does require him or her to have current funding but the nice piece is that it provides protected time to mentor junior scientists. And so we think that offering more of these K-5 opportunities to create some FOAs related to that would be one excellent suggestion. Another possibility is something like the K-18. And I've noticed a few FOAs out for this K-18 recently. Now, for this, this very directly impacts the mentors themselves. I'm sure many of you are aware that this is for experienced scientists to either augment or redirect their research programs by acquiring new skills. So that's nice for the faculty who want to learn more from an engineering perspective or some other perspective. They will receive that training, but really it's going to be a trickle-down effect in terms of how this might affect the pre-doctoral students because this award doesn't really directly affect them. It helps the mentor, who then hopefully would teach them some of these skills they're learning. Something like the K-26 for the mid-career faculty is a nice um, option as well. And again, we don't see any currently available FOAs under this mechanism, but it does provide some protected time for research and mentoring. And so we believe that creating more opportunities and FOAs on some of these mechanisms might be useful. Other things that could additionally even get to the institutional level, as Kelly mentioned, you know, we have the institutional level, the faculty level, and the student level. And something like the conference mechanisms, the R13, U13, could be useful in order for groups of physical activity researchers to, to have workshops to put together some sort of programming or training kind of thing that then we could put out as this is the kind of training that's basic for physical activity researchers and, and create some materials surrounding that. Additionally, we thought perhaps expanding R15s could be a solution path, even though the R15s are really meant for institutions that typically don't receive NIH funding. The nice piece of those R15s is that there has to be documented student involvement. And while the traditionally receiving NIH institutions um, may have students around and maybe the students are involved, there's no real aim at, for sure, involving students in the research. So maybe something like expanding the R15s could, could help facilitate more students being involved with research. In addition to that, the diversity supplements are an option as well. Um, of course, right now they require the active R01 funding, 
And if we were to jump ahead and think about the students, I know that there is one uh, F31 mechanism that addresses the diversity piece, but to really expand the diversity supplements and perhaps not necessarily tied into existing R01 funding could be useful. For specifically to the pre-doc trainees, obviously the F31s are out there and a great mechanism. The F30s are out there, which support a dual degree mechanism, but typically those are for MD and PhD or DO, PhD, something like that. And we thought it might be interesting to create a version that supports a dual PhD, such that someone could obtain a PhD in chemistry and epidemiology and have that be supported through an F30. There are other mechanisms that are, could potentially be used as well, some sort of online educational platforms that could be created for students, and maybe those would come out of the workshop or conference kinds of grants, or maybe NIH would choose to, to gather some experts and produce these sorts of things. So those could be used. In addition to, we noticed the R25 mechanism, which right now, all of the FOAs that I could find on the R25 seem to be aimed towards scientists not really towards student training, and so perhaps that mechanism could be used for student training. Now, all of this said, Kelly already um, sort of alluded to this in terms of the, the training and the skill set everyone has, but the bottom line is if any of these mechanisms are to be expanded, then reviewers will be needed, and we definitely need to work on making sure we have a suitable peer reviewer network for physical activity-focused grant applications. So to summarize, um, we do have silos right now in our physical activity research and training. We need to figure out better ways to really facilitate the transdisciplinary research. The infrastructure isn't quite there yet, um, and a lot of these opportunities are individually driven. And so, of course, if we can optimize a team science approach for the future generation, that would be really useful to be raising transdisciplinary scientists instead of expecting them to figure out how to do it when they get there. And if we use an approach that targets academic institutions, mentors, and students alike, um, then I think in the formative years we could really do a little bit better with our training and take away some of those silos. And so, of course, strategic planning is uh, definitely a next step and I will now turn it over to Matt. Okay, thank you, Karen. And so Genevieve and I are going to uh, kind of move now. Uh, the focus so far has been on the pre-doc stage. And so now moving more into faculty, postdoc types of uh, stages focusing more on where we are as a field and where we can go forward and how NIH can support that. Uh, we'll be talking about equipping physical activity scientists to exploit technology and complex data beyond where we currently have been over the last 10 years or so, which has really been in the formative years of exploiting these types of technologies. So I want to just start to say so far we've really been talking about a transdisciplinary approach that has really brought together exercise science and uh, public health. But to even expand that question even more broadly, what does a transdisciplinary approach in physical activity science really look like? What does it mean to really engage across disciplines, engaging disciplines together uh, to really solve um, important um, uh, public health issues? I would argue that while, while, as has been stated, there is a long way to go to bridge public health and exercise science, if we really want to exploit technology and uh, really uh, move forward in the most promising and exciting research questions around physical activity, we also need to engage many other disciplines, and we need to do that in a more cohesive way that follows this translational spectrum. So what I would like to share with you just briefly is to highlight three what I would consider um, promising areas of research um, that by necessity uh, require that we engage a number of scientists across the spectrum and uh, many different fields together 
in order to really sort of um, exploit those particular areas. And then Genevieve will follow up with some, some really great suggestions on how NIH can help to support that uh, pathway going forward. So issue one is a broad one to looking at focusing both within and beyond day level estimates of physical activity. With the technology that we now have available through um, you know, very ubiquitous accelerometry and other ways of measuring behavior, we now can capture data at much finer uh, levels of, uh, of resolution than we ever have been able to before. And I think we've, we, because we have that, we have the ability to really look both at the within-day patterns of physical activity and how that impacts health, and then as well as the uh, across-day or beyond-day level or macro-level weekly, monthly, and seasonal patterns of physical activity and how they impact health. And I think that these uh, in, are important areas at explaining things that over the course of the last 50 years in exercise science have remained unexplained, particularly as it relates to um, uh, inter-individual differences in training and issues like that where we haven't been able to capture the behavior as precisely as, as we've needed. And we can then also try to apply micro-level analytics such as machine learning which is something that obviously has grown in, um, in use at the micro level with accelerometry, uh, we can use that to solve some of these macro level data problems um, to be able to understand patterns at the weekly, monthly, and, and even seasonal levels. But to do this, we really need to engage many different disciplines um, in really integrated ways. Um, and just to name a few, uh, disciplines like uh, GIS and data informatics, biomedical informatics, bioengineering, and biostatistics. Another important and promising new area is to adopt uh, a 24-hour approach to physical activity epidemiology and intervention. So as was alluded to um, early on by uh, Heather, uh, we really need to move beyond the typical um, uh, definition that focuses exclusively on energy expenditure as the unidimensional construct. We have the capabilities to do that and when we bring the right scientists together across public health and other disciplines, I think we can move uh, much further, much more rapidly uh, with the types of technologies that we have available. So looking at uh, developing new metrics of physical activity that can better explain inter-individual differences in response to physical activity using those technologies, uh, starting to look at interactions and synergies among behaviors across the 24 hours rather than focusing exclusively upon the single behavior of moderate to vigorous physical activity, really understanding how people use their time across the 24 hours. And then bringing that up to the intervention level, understanding multiple behavior interventions, how can we leverage a number of behaviors simultaneously to create more synergistic um, uh, interventions that, that, that can um, proliferate the entire 24 hours. Of course, to do that, we need to have a better understanding of a, of a number of fields, um, including the field of sleep, which uh, you know, typically sleep and physical activity scientists um, have not really engaged together so well. Sociology and anthropology is important in this particular area. And then time use experts who understand trade-offs among time um, is, is uh, really, really important. And finally, uh, we have the opportunity now, given emerging technologies, to really impact population health through technology. But we need to really do that in a really careful way, in a very um, thoughtful way. In particular, we need to uh, learn to build and leverage technologies that reduce the technology divide and not increase the technology divide. So we can do this if we engage the right types of computer scientists and human-computer interaction specialists who can really who understand how to develop technologies and the systematic processes to develop them to target specific user groups. Um, and so I think that's an important area that we need to really pay attention to as we develop these technologies that we are actually doing it for the greater good and not expanding current disparities. Um, and then I think that NIH in particular can use some of, some of its um, uh, some, of, some, of, uh, some of its strengths to build consortium partnerships with industry. It's difficult for individual scientists or institutions 
to reach out to large industry uh, leaders um, for partnerships. But if something can be done at a higher level, which it's being done in certain areas with big data uh, 2K, et cetera, um, we can start to leverage those um, partnerships in a more systematic way to really exploit the types of data that are already being collected. But to, again, to do this, we're going to need computer scientists, in, um, industry leaders, human con computer interaction folks, and then I think dissemination and implementation scientists who understand how we can effectively roll this out to really impact uh, population health. And so with that, I will uh, pass the slides on over to Genevieve, and she's going to speak about how NIH uh, can uh, play a role here. All right. So there we go. Thanks, Matt. And I think Matt did an excellent job of outlining some of the cutting edge research problems and questions that our field currently faces. And what I'm going to address um, is how NIH can potentially enable physical activity researchers to address these problems and their complexities. And uh, really, again, to iterate that, we're focusing on beyond the formative years and, and we're focusing on postdoctoral training years and beyond into faculty level research. And along these lines, what is critically important is the need to foster a career-long learning approach. And this is something that both Karen and Kelly touched on, but we want to elaborate this point further in that instead of thinking of this as a learning curve, per se, that where, where there's a, an, an where there's more emphasis in the, the doctoral training years, we need to think about this as a learning line where there's essentially equal weight and emphasis on learning throughout the entire career. And that's because technologies and our and sensors and our ability to analyze those data are continually moving forward at a very rapid pace. And, and, and we expect that to continue uh, into the future. So as those technologies and opportunities are advancing at a rapid pace, we need to think about our learning continuing uh, throughout one's entire career. And with that, it's almost a, essentially a, a, a paradigm shift in what we think about in terms of training, right? We don't have overemphasis on the early years. We need to emphasize the entirety of one's career. And so then viewing postdoc and PhD training as just the beginning, and to facilitate this lifelong or career-long learning, we need to offer and support, and, and through NIH and other mechanisms, introductory technology and data workshops and that, that target both junior, mid, and senior level scientists. And there, there certainly is support, some support out there, but, but certainly, um, more of this could it could help. There's I, I I can't tell you about the number of researchers that come come to, to me and my research group and ask about how do I how do I start um, using EMA or other um, real time data capture re uh, um, devices in my research. And this is something that can be challenging for a mid or senior level researcher to to initiate. And and so there certainly needs to be um, more opportunities for training in these areas. And then following with some of the initial ideas that Kelly and Karen pointed out or mentioned in terms of funding mechanisms that support coursework and training for mid and senior level scientists. And, and um, she did mention some mechanisms, the KO5 or the um, K24 or the KO2, um, but um, which support mid and senior level um, investigators, but she did mention that the, the K05 and the K26 currently don't, don't have funding announcements um, in those areas. And this is something that um, certainly more of these and more and um, investigators being more aware of them and applying to them and, and finding more support to them, I think, could advance ourselves significantly in these areas. And Uh, what else um, NIH could do to help is to incentivize and nurture creativity. And um, there are several ways that this could be done. And one is to develop more high-risk funding mechanisms. 
And I know there's been some out there, some great examples, the NCI provocative questions, mechanisms that encourage researchers to, to, to take more risks and, and um, maybe go out on a limb a little bit more. And, and this is because the complexity of the research questions we're asking may not have a lot of preliminary data. Um, and so, obviously, preliminary data is important to show um, feasibility and potential for success, but sometimes collecting preliminary data, especially when we're, when we're talking about the areas of mobile health and big data, can be quite resource, resource intensive to collect. Um, developing an app and testing that app can, can cost thousands of thousands of dollars, and that's just to collect, you know, pilot data for, for a grant, and that might not be possible. So if we're limited in that, in those areas, we're limiting the potential um, of the research that can come out. So less emphasis on preliminary data might be helpful on, on certain mechanisms, certainly not across the board, but in, in strategic ways, um, maybe more exploratory uh, grants that allow more exploratory aims instead of hypothesis-driven aims and more methods development. Um, thinking of ways that, um, NIH can support programs of research instead of maybe specific projects might foster and, and, and nurture creativity. And some great examples out there are the NCI Outstanding Investigator, the R35 award that provides seven, up to seven years of funding for um, an investigator to pursue various aspects of their a program of research that's outlined, outlined more generally. Um, and um, this type of work can allow the flexibility and the support to take risks and, and venture in new creative directions. And then another area um, that could certainly be supported is the encouragement of more theory-driven and concept design. And this can come in a number of ways. Um, there could be explicit components of funding announcements that, 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 um, that encourage and um, elicit theory development um, and theory testing within the grant itself. And there's, um, there was a U01 on intensive um, longitudinal analysis of health behaviors that did specifically address theory and theory development in its um, scope with, of the funding announcement. But there also um, can be more opportunities for researchers to present and publish their concept papers or theory papers, and some of these papers may not have a lot of data yet. But but, it, but putting ideas out there and connecting the dots, essentially, and providing a framework um, for other researchers to potentially follow could be useful. And, and, and certainly not waiting until all the data is collected and then trying to figure it out, but maybe trying to um, encourage ways either through special sec uh, sections within journals, special issues, parts of conferences that are both focused on theory development and con conceptual development could certainly help to drive the field forward in, in, in leaps and bounds. And next, um, and this has been touched on certainly throughout this presentation, but I want to echo and reiterate these points of, the, of er erasing disciplinary boundaries and silos and thinking about developing new types of funding mechanisms that might require a multiple PI, but a, multiple PIs from different disciplines, um, that that might be a re potential requirement, and not just maybe one PI, maybe two, or, or maybe three PIs. Um, some, some examples, um, it, the active living research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that program um, did, did require at least co-eyes from multiple disciplines to be on a grant. And so this is an idea to, um, you know, encourage and, and entice and incentivize researchers to begin to, to um, reach across the, the disciplinary aisle, so to say. Um, also developing funding mechanisms that might um, add an ancillary measure to an existing cohort or an existing study, but that ancillary measure or set of measures might be required to come from a different discipline. And so um, an example that um, is uh, currently out there of a funding announcement is um, funded by NIDDK, uh, supported by NIDDK and OBSSR on um, adding ancillary um, behavioral and psychological phenotypes to existing studies of obesity. And it's an, an interesting example of where um, an existing obesity cohort study is, is encouraged to add another type of, of a measure that might not have been included at all, but coming from a diff potentially a different discipline. So these are great ways to leverage upon existing um, studies and existing cohorts by adding um, brand new measures that weren't um, 
conceptualized up front. And then lastly, it's trying to limit the procedural and bureaucratic challenges of cross-institutional collaboration and, and even um, cross-departmental or cross-school collaborations on grants, even within school, within universities, that there's, you know, whether this be across institutions and all the challenges that come from subs and, and, and secondary subs and tertiary subs and um, even within universities, there's a lot of challenges of working across departments and across schools in terms of how the, the funding is allocated, and that can certainly slow things down. And my last point would be um, thinking about how NIH can help in supporting the infrastructure for um, data and algorithm sharing. And there's some really good work that's, that's going on in those areas, and I, I want to highlight those, those, um, those efforts and then also think about, encourage um, program officers and others to think about further work that can be done. So funding mechanisms and repositories and procedures for sharing big data and pooling, we know that this is challenging, right? There's certainly privacy issues and data security issues to work through, and there's a lot of interesting uh, and uh, challenging efforts going on um, in these areas, but thinking about potential mechanisms that can support pooling of big data, especially when there's common measures, such as um, smartphone or smartwatch accelerometry that, um, collected, um, or even actograph accelerometry that's collected, you know, in a similar way across many, many studies, and thinking of either cooperative agreements or other mechanisms to, to um, pool those data, um, developing toolboxes to disseminate and research-grade algorithm, and, um, and MCI sensor methods collaboratory is doing a great job in this area, and then recruiting large cohorts. And, and that can allow researchers to plug and play potential apps and, and wearables um, in, in a kind of easy on, easy off approach of the all of us cohort. So that, with this, I'm going to pass it back to the larger group for questions, or actually back to Heather for questions. Thanks, Genevieve and Matt and Kelly and Karen for presenting today. Um, if you guys have questions, webinar listeners, if you have questions, please begin to type them in the question box as we wrap up here. Um, we just want to give a quick summary of everything and then open it to you for any questions, if you have questions for our four speakers. Um, I really appreciate speakers that you provided suggestions for actions that would address the field at large and are more upstream for the research community. You presented a lot of ideas, and it seems like they align along two kind of major themes. One is strengthening opportunities for creating transdisciplinary minds and, and to really make sure that we're balancing kinesiology and public health and not uh, weighing too heavily on one or the other. And then another issue of thinking about how to clear a road for more sophisticated uh, and technology-enabled methods. Um, you know, when people hear about innovation, they often lead to concern about risk and how to manage that risk. And um, your call for engaging community and strategic planning is really essential for that. So I think that that seems like a wise place to start. Um, we'll see if we can't, you know, figure out how to, how to facilitate that. You know, we, we often think about what we can do to help improve physical activity research methods in the community, but when we conceptualize those consensus tasks, they're usually aimed at promoting uniformity or standardization, and there's just so much potential and the research now that I think that we could be limiting that or inhibiting that. And whether we want to articulate it or not, these, these tasks, these consensus tasks, are usually aimed at raising the floor, and there are lots of issues with that. Um, we've had some past experience with this at NCI. We've, at, at different intervals, tried to come up with best practices for accelerometry. And, you know, the truth of it is that this is really a judgment call. There's no one right way to assess physical activity, and the best we can do is tell people how to make good judgment. Um, but uh, Alex Montoy and colleagues uh, create, uh, con um, conducted a review of, of intervention studies to see, are they following that guidance? You know, intervention researchers, are they following the guidance that's provided by the measurement community on how to report the decisions they make with their assessment? And uh, really what they found is that the reporting of studies has been poor and has only improved minimally over time. So you can spend a lot of time trying to improve uniformity and standardization, um, but is that the best place to focus in this environment? And I would suggest, uh, as a funding agency, it might make more sense to focus on raising the ceiling. And really, that is going to entail collecting different data, not the same data we've been collecting, 
uh, but with the promise then that we can maybe bring more utility to our basic research, um, you know, to bring more utility to that fundamental understanding, to have a more integrated biobehavioral understanding, and to bring more fundamental understanding to our applied research, you know, and instead of focusing on a device or an app or an instrument, you know, really trying to tease out principles of elegant design, and then bringing those two things together, you know, to come up with some information about how physical activity works to improve the public's health. Uh, I want to thank again our speakers for um, talking with us today about some of the opportunities, some of the challenges. You, did, uh, you provided a lot of insight to this, and I do appreciate it. Um, I, I haven't seen too many questions pop up here, and we're nearly out of time. There was one question about whether or not slides will be sent out, and yes, they will. Uh, slides and a recording will be sent out sometime in the next few weeks, so if you need to take some information back to your programs, uh, that information will be made available to you. Does anybody have any any questions? If you do have a question, you can type it in the question box there on the screen. I, I have a question for our speakers, and we have a couple of minutes, so I don't know who wants to take it, but. Um, where are the societies in this? So we have, we're inundated. Our physical activity and health researchers are inundated. We have lots of places we can go. Does anybody have a sense of where the societies are? Um, I can speak okay, no to Genevieve. Oh, I can speak just a minute about um, where the APHA is. Um, it, it's interesting, um, about six years ago, or actually about eight, eight years ago, um, APHA, um, the, there was a group of people within APHA who wanted to start a physical activity um, section, and specifically physical activity was included under the, um, the food and nutrition section, which was big, and so it went through the whole process of um, going through a special interest group for three years, which is temporary status, and then into a section, and now it's a permanent section, and still has growing members each year, and I was fortunate to be involved in that transition. So I think that, we, and, and clearly, APHA is critical to what we're talking about here, it's the, you know, the public health side, so at least there's um, support. Um, however, you know, like, like, you know, all societies that, you know, they're, they're really focused on the annual meeting and then what happens in between, you know, the annual meeting can be really up to what types of funding or what types of, um, you know, energy of individual leaders to continue that. I will tag on to that, Heather. Um, this is Karen. I think that the societies, as Genevieve was alluding to, you know, they have their own priorities and they're doing their own things to advance their organizations. And so I'm not sure that they always are thinking about training the future and and those sorts of things. I do think, um, you know, there's been a proliferation of niche type of organizations over the last several years. And so probably for physical activity assessment, the ICAM PAM group is probably really pushing the envelope the most in terms of the research that's being presented at the meeting. Um, you know, the American College of Sports Medicine used to be the place. There are some new things being presented there, but but not as much as something like an ICAM PAM. I, I think there are, you know, on the behavioral side, the the ISBIN PA meetings. Um, a lot of people have been turning to that source, but in the end, you know, some are, they're, they're not typically really getting at some of these issues or um, trying to form the big questions and, and drive the field forward that way. It's, it's more of a place for people to, to present their work, I think. Thanks, Karen and Genevieve. That's that's really helpful, and I know uh, Robert's going to be pushing us to get off the phone here in the next minute. Uh, I just want to say thank you. It sounds like there's an opportunity for us here to work with the community and bring some cohesion to the community that the community wants it and is ready for it. Um, and so we will we will see if we can help in that regard. Robert, over to you. All right, and with that, we have run out of time. I want to thank everyone for attending, and especially thank our presenters for an engaging discussion on these important topics. 
If you have further questions or comments, please feel free to contact us using the information on the screen. And thanks very much.